Hello everybody, we're going to talk about renal ultrasound today, um, and let's get started. So the objectives we're going to talk about in this uh, lecture are um, anatomy, we'll go over some of the anatomy of the genitourinary system, we'll talk about the indications for renal ultrasound, we'll go through the entire bedside exam, and we'll discuss some pathology and cases. So as you remember, the anatomy of the kidney um, you have your medulla there or your medullary pyramids. Those are going to be hypoechoic um, compared to your renal pelvis or renal sinus, which is filled with fat, so it's going to be hyperechoic. Um, and we'll go through uh, where the vessels um, and ureter come out at the hilum. So just to compare the anatomy with an actual image of the kidney, you can see it's very similar and you can compare the different grayscales to help you understand uh, the anatomy that you're looking at. So um, you can see the exterior part um, has gerotis fascia and perinephric fat, which is going to be hyperechoic as mentioned. The renal pelvis is also hyperechoic and renal sinus, which is where you would see it dilated if there was hydronephrosis, um, which would be anechoic within that hyperechoic area. The medulla is more hypoechoic to the cortex, um, and then the calyces obviously draining into the renal pelvis. So the kidneys are paired, they're mobile, and they're retroperitoneal organisms. And just to um, emphasize the kidneys and then the ureters and bladder, this is a closed system. So, you know, if the patient has for example, acute urinary retention, you're going to see hydro, and this doesn't necessarily mean that there's a stone, so just keep that in mind. And this is just comparing the right to the left. You can see the left side is a little bit more superior, and um, so, you know, a lot of times when you do a renal exam, they're not going to be always um, exactly symmetric. So what are the indications for a renal um, ultrasound? There's multiple um, indications. There's flank pain. We have renal colic. There's urinary retention, if you want to measure a bladder volume, acute renal failure, hematuria, um, abscesses, trauma, etc. The main one that we're going to focus on is flank pain, um, which is um, hydronephrosis is basically what we're looking for. That's our primary focus for renal um, ultrasound. The sensitivity and specificity of renal ultrasound in trained users is very good. Um, 80 to 94% sensitivity and specificity 82 to 99%. So we're very good at picking this up. This was a recent study that came out just um, in 2014 um, in the New England Journal of Medicine um, that was talking about ultrasound versus CT. There were about 2,700 patients and basically they were 18 to 76 years old and they left it up to the discretion of the physician taking care of the patient whether they really thought the patient had a stone and wanted to start with ultrasound or, or if they were worried about other pathologies then they could exclude the patient and go ahead to CT or whatever. So um, they had about 2,700, they started with ultrasound and basically the whole point is that over the last 10 years or more um, CT has had a tenfold increase, so we're irradiating people left and right. And that has a lot to do with just advanced technology. It has to, to do with our, our um, society and the increased um, lawsuits, things like that with physicians. We don't want to miss things. So um, the whole point of the study is that the patients did not, they had less radiation, and even if they did an ultrasound first and then they felt like either they didn't find anything or they felt like they still needed a CT for some reason and they went to CT, they still did not have um, more radiation than had they just gone to CT initially. So overall, I think it's a good study in that it just helps us think about doing ultrasound first. It's not necessarily... Um, you know, the end-all be-all, especially if you have an older person or you're worried about other pathology, CT is going to be your best option. Option, So just something to think about. So let's talk about the technique. 
We can use the phased array probe, which is the probe on the left, or the abdominal curvilinear probe, which is the probe on the right. Um, with our new export machines, we only have the phased array probes, and the, the machines in trauma only have the phased array. So you can definitely use the one on the left for abdominal ultrasounding. I just always usually prefer the curvilinear. It seems to have better resolution, so if it's available, I will probably use that. So you want to scan through the kidneys in coronal and transverse. So right coronal view is, uh, you can see how the probe is placed there. You want your indicator up towards the patient's head. Um, and this is the image that you should get of the kidney in longitudinal. Um, so you see again the perinephric fat, the cortex, and then the medulla is a little bit hypoechoic to the uh, cortex, and then the renal sinus again is bright. So just thinking about orientation, if we take the kidney um, and we look at the anatomical man and our probe there is looking, um, cutting the patient coronally, um, what would be your um, uh, directions and uh, your um, orientation for the images. So um, obviously if we turn this image up right, um, the top is always where the probe is touching, so that would be lateral. And then um, opposite of lateral would be medial because we're out laterally looking medially and then indicators towards the patient's head, so to the left of the screen, um, would correspond to the indicator. Um, and that's actually the patient's right, or I'm sorry, the patient's head and then feet. Same thing here. You can see the psoas muscle up under there is striated in appearance and then the liver um, by the kidney. So just scanning through the liver and kidney can see the different grayscale um, and helps you identify the anatomy of the kidney. So right transverse. So we're on the same side, indicators towards the bed, and we get a um, transverse image of the kidney. In this instance, you can actually see the ureter coming out of the um, kidney and the different, uh, you can see a medullary pyramid there as well. And again, we're still cutting the patient lateral and medial, so that hasn't changed. The only thing that's changed is that we've flipped the transducer. So now indicators towards the bed, which is posterior, and then opposite of that would be anterior. Another view of uh, lateral or transverse kidney, I'm sorry. Then you can see the renal capsule, perinephric fat. So let's go over the other side, uh, which is going to be very similar. Indicator is towards the patient's head, and if you can see uh, in both of uh, both of the coronal views that the probe is slightly oblique, uh, just to get the most longitudinal view of the kidney, and so you can play around with that and see what gives you the most longitudinal view. So scanning through the kidney on this side looks very similar. It's just that on this side you see spleen, which is smaller than liver, um, and get a good view of the kidney. Same thing here, except for indicators up towards the uh, ceiling um, to get a transverse view. And so this is just a little um, helpful thing to think about when you're doing renal. Um, we'll call it the four C's, and it's co contrast, contour, contour, collecting system, and compare. So you want to look at the contrast, the grayscale contrast of the kidney um, and the things within the kidney. You want to look at the contour of the kidney. Are there any masses or cysts, um, or is it very smooth? You want to look at the co collecting system, which is within the renal sinus, and then you want to compare it to the other side to see, you know, is it symmetric or is it asymmetric? So this is just comparing, and if you'll see on the left, A is actually the width, um, which corresponds to B on the right side, so don't get those confused and then B on the left corresponds with A on the right. So normal kidney should be about um, nine to 12 long, and then about four to six wide. So as long as it's somewhere in there and symmetric, then you should be good. And then this would just be a case of, you know, looking at both sides and obviously 
the right side is uh, there's hydro present compared to the left side. So then you want to scan through the bladder in sagittal and transverse. So when we scan through the bladder, uh, we want to make sure that we are right above the pubic symphysis and then press straight in and then look um, back because the bladder, depending on how full it is, is going to be back behind the pubic symphysis. And so if it's not very full, it's going to be difficult to see and you're going to have to rock back and really look back behind the pubic symphysis area. So we start off in sagittal, indicators towards the patient's head, and we get a triangular shape bladder. Um, so we are anatomically on the anterior part of the patient, so therefore the opposite is posterior. Um, and then we have the indicator towards the head, so head and feet. And then transverse, uh, we just rotate the probe with the indicator towards the patient's right, and we get a more uh, rectangular view of the bladder. Again, we have not changed anterior-posterior, we have just rotated the probe, and so the indicator is now right to left. Ureteral jets. Um, this is just visualizing urine flowing from the ureter into the bladder. And this is color power Doppler that we have it on. So it's color power Doppler is different than color in that it doesn't really look at direction, um, but it just shows you the flow. And you can see at the bottom there, uh, right down near the trigone of the bladder, you'll see the um, uh, ureter entering and the right side kind of diagonally shooting towards the left and the left side diagonally shooting towards the right. So this just tells you that the ureters are patent. Um, if one side had severe hydro or you were worried about complete obstruction from some reason, then it should not have ureteral jets on that side. Just again looking at another example of some ureteral jets. So normal variance, um, just a couple of things. Um, looking at this kidney, you can see um, that the renal sinus, it looks like there's a space in between. And this is just called a dual collecting system. Sometimes you'll see that where it looks like there's, there's a break there in the renal sinus. Um, and it's just a dual collecting system that you can see um, occasionally. This is an example, um, sorry, it's a little blurry, but uh, it's the best example I could find um, of a left-sided kidney. And you can see at the top there, if you're looking at the contour, it kind of goes up uh, like a hump on that side. And this is called a dromedary hump, and it's just named after the uh, camel. And this is just, again, a normal variant that you can see, and it has to do with um, the uh, kidney fitting up by the spleen on the left side. Again, just a normal variant. So renal pathology, um, obviously the biggest thing that we're concerned about is hydro. So um, let's talk about the varying degrees of hydro. So there's normal, mild, moderate, and severe. And this is a bit of a subjective measurement. So as you can see, normal to mild, um, you get a little bit of dilation and then a little bit more in moderate. So really the only difference is between moderate and severe, you'll get some uh, thinning of the cortex, which you can see there in the severe portion. So again, this is just a subjective finding. So really the degree of hydro um, in, in studies, they found a relationship between the degree um, of hydro seen on ultrasound and the ureteral stone size on CT. So you can kind of look at that and get an idea of maybe how obstructed they may be. But again, a closed system, so if they're extremely dehydrated, you may not see any hydro and that does not rule out a stone. You can uh, hydrate the patient and re-ultrasound them if you're not performing a CT and then see if they have hydro at that point. Um, if there's no hydro, then you may be concerned about other things. So just don't get boxed into thinking it's only a renal problem um, if the patient seems to be having uh, renal colic and you're not really finding any hydro, then you may need to think elsewhere like uh, abdominal aorta for a AAA, um, gallbladder for biliary colic, um, could have pancreatitis, um, there are a lot of other things that can cause um, colic, and so especially in our older patients, you definitely do not want to get boxed into that. So causes of hydro. There are internal causes, so within the genitourinary system, 
um, like stone uh, that we just talked about, there are external causes. So external causes would be like something compressing the ureter externally, like a mass tumor, colon cancer, um, aneurysm, um, or some other uh, etiology. Congenital, you can't have congenital hydro. Um, I'm not really sure the exact cause of it, um, but you do see it. Um, and then physiologic would be, for example, pregnancy. You can see uh, hydronephrosis, especially on the right side. Um, and that's just the physiologic changes of pregnancy can cause vasodilatation of the, or I'm sorry, uh, dilatation of the ureter uh, on that right side. So let's look at some mild cases of hydro. This would be a very mild case you can see within the renal sinus. So you're looking for finger-like projections uh, within that bright white renal sinus. Um, so it needs to be outlined by the hyperechoic region. So another example of mild hydro. Just scanning through, you can see some mild hydro there. So hydro is just urine backed up into the kidney, and uh, if you put color on it, which I'll show you in a minute, there should be no flow because it is not a vessel, it's just urine. So it should be anechoic in that area. So let's look at some moderate. So a little bit more dilated, you can see on that side. coming out into the uh, ureter, it appears. Uh, so not just hydro of the kidney, but uh, hydro ureter probably. And again, you can see here um, some hydronephrosis on this side that is moderate. I don't really see thinning of the cortex. Again, more moderate hydro. So severe, let's look at severe cases. Uh, this would be a very severe case. Um, of hydro, almost like an external urinary pelvis as well. Another example of severe hydro with some thinning of the cortex. Still image there of the same video. And then some more severe hydro. So here's some examples of color flow. So if we put color on there, you can see that there's no flow within that renal sinus anechoic area, which would be consistent with hydro. Again, flow around it, but not within it. So another reason that we use renal ultrasound um, pretty consistently um, is bladder volume. So if we wanna calculate a bladder volume for urinary retention, if the patient comes in with urinary retention for some cause, it could be um, that they have a catheter in but it's not draining or it could be that they just got out of surgery and maybe the medications are causing them to have urinary retention or it could be that they have um, caught equina um, and that would be the first sign of their um, their caught equina syndrome from a disc herniation in the back um, it could be that we just want to get a post-void residual in the case of somebody that we're worried about caught equina. Uh, and bladder filling would be more in pediatric and maybe our Takachali patients that can't speak uh, or can't give us a clean specimen and we need to get a straight calf urine and you don't want to go in and straight calf a patient and them have an empty bladder. So you can quickly look at their bladder to make sure that there is urine there so that when you do go do the catheter, that it's not a pointless procedure and obviously you don't want to have to do it twice. So the way we calculate it is uh, you'll have to go up and you want your um, settings on abdo abdomen. You can see at the bottom there it's on abdominal um, and you find the bladder in transverse and sagittal and um, it's this particular image is transverse, so you can see that it's rectangular in shape. So if you think about the sagittal and transverse views of the bladder, you are still anterior on both. You've just rotated your probe. So they're both going to have anterior posterior, and then one's going to have right left, and one's going to have head feet. So you want to have three measurements, anterior posterior, right left, and head feet. 
and that will give you the three dimensions of the bladder that you measure. So you'll have to go into calculations and you'll see uh, three volumes or sometimes it says the letter D is in David um, and you'll do like D1, D2, D3. And so you, you get the first one, you measure it, you save it. You get the second one, you measure it, you save it. You get the third one, you measure it and you save it. Um, and so uh, then by the third one, then it will give you the actual volume as you can see up there. Um, it's saying 214, so we go here uh, for the sagittal view and it's 302 cc's of urine. So renal cysts, these are pretty common. Uh, you will see them if you do any amount of fast exams or renal exams looking at the kidneys. So cysts in general are anechoic. Um, they're well-defined and there should be posterior acoustic enhancement, um, which is just that brightness that you see uh, just posterior to any fluid filled um, object because it has had no loss of signal or attenuation as the signal goes through there. Um, so here's an example of a renal cyst um, just on the tip of that kidney. Here's another example of a renal cyst, circular, anechoic. Here's another example of a renal cyst. They should be pretty easy to spot. Here's multiple cysts, and so what do you think this patient may have? show you a still example and then another example so this patient probably has polycystic kidney disease which um, you know causes renal failure and then these are the people that get very aneurysms um, and sometimes have to have their kidneys removed renal stones so we can see renal stones in the kidney um, we usually do not see them in the ureter because we cannot follow the ureter all the way down. If it's right adjacent to the kidney, like in the proximal ureter or the very distal ureter adjacent to the bladder, then sometimes you can see it. But otherwise, in the area in between, you're probably not going to see a stone. So renal stones in the kidneys um, are going to be hyperechoic uh, or bright, and they have a posterior clean shadow as opposed to the dirty shadow that you would see with bowel. Um, so you can just see a uh, hyperechoic area and then the bright or the dark um, black, very well demarcated shadow posterior to that area. Again, curvilinear hyperechoic with the well demarcated shadow behind. And that's just because bone or calcium stones are not going to conduct um, ultrasound waves so it's going to be completely blocked and that's why you get the shadow behind. So renal masses um, they are solid and they're going to appear heterogeneous and not well demarcated and if you ever see any of these or you're concerned that the patient may have a renal cell carcinoma then you should get a formal study um, because radiology is much better at looking at these than we are um, so if there's any concern do not ever rely on your own judgment. Um, especially because these are very uh, malignant cancers that can metastasize very quickly and so you want to get the proper diagnosis as soon as possible. I can't say that I've seen a lot of these um, in my hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of ultrasounds but um, you know if you do see one that you need to be um, aware of it. So you can see obviously the circular area there and it's heterogeneous and more hypoechoic, more consistent with like cortex um, echogenicity. This would be more like a transitional cell carcinoma of the bladder um, because this is a picture of the bladder and you can see a large cancer there. So infection um, so say the patient has a UTI or even pylo, the most common finding on ultrasound is what? It would be normal. But there are a few things that you can see, um, one being emphysematous pylo um, and the other being uh, renal abscess. I can't see say that um, I would see prominent renal stranding um, compared to the other side, that would be pretty subtle, I think, on ultrasound. Um, but that's a common finding that we see on CT. 
um, sometimes with pilo or uh, um, just any concern for renal infection, but I don't know that you would see that on ultrasound. So emphysematous pilo, um, patient's going to be obviously extremely sick. And um, this was a patient that we had back in the trauma bay. Um, and you can see um, there's multiple bright hyperechoic areas throughout the kidney and kind of a dirty shadow, like the shadow you see with, with bowel gas around that area. Um, if you look at the still image, you can see those dirty shadows. They're kind of whitish coming down and then the multiple foci of air. So this is air within the kidney. So air always shows up bright white and it kind of twinkles like bowel gas. So this is definitely not a good thing. Renal abscess, again, not very common. Uh, I can't say that I've actually seen a case uh, on my own. Um, and can look similar to cysts or maybe even masses. So you're going to compare it to the clinical setting. Um, obviously, if the patient's sick, they have a fever, um, then you're going to be more concerned about this and may need to get more imaging. But you can see uh, back on this last one that the area on the right, actually punctate ones even on the left, with septations would be more consistent with the renal. This is more of a necrotic uh, renal abscess. Again, it looks almost like a cyst, but there's a whole bunch of septations within it. Okay, let's go over a few renal cases. Um, and these are meant to just, you know, be challenging and to help you um, really think about your differential diagnosis. So case one, 33-year-old female with no past medical history presents with dysuria and fever, max temp of 101, denies vaginal discharge, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. So her temp is 100.2, respirations 13, pulse 91, blood pressure 121 over 74, SATs 100% already air, and so you do a bedside ultrasound and you get these images. So the right kidney is measuring 11.5 by 5 centimeters and the left kidney is measuring 5 by 2.9 centimeters. So you get her urine back, it's positive, she has no blood. Um, her beta quant is negative, so she's not pregnant. Um, she appears pretty comfortable and she's tolerating PO. So what do you want to do? What's your disposition of this patient? Do you want to admit the patient? Do you want to discharge the patient with follow-up? Do you want to discharge the patient with PO antibiotics? Or do you want to discharge them after one dose of Cipro? I don't have my Jeopardy music, but a uh, couple more seconds and the answer is admit the patient. So if you're confused, let's just look at the images. Um, this, so this patient came in, no past medical history, didn't know anything. This, you know, this actually happened to me when I was a fellow. Um, I was just randomly scanning people. And so I was back in our minor care area and I scanned a very healthy young Hispanic girl and, uh, you know, quickly noticed that one kidney was really small and one kidney was really big, and she didn't know anything about that. So she did have a UTI, and they were about to discharge her on antibiotics. And so once I told them this, it changed their dispo because basically she has a congenitally atrophied kidney, so she might as well be a single kidney patient. And any single kidney patient should be admitted for IV antibiotics um, and obviously monitoring their creatinine because you don't want to knock out that last kidney, especially if they have pilo. Um, you definitely want to bring them in because uh, you don't want to miss that and uh, be careful obviously with dye in these patients when you CT them if you ever have a single kidney patient then you probably don't want to give them IV dye unless it's really necessary um, and obviously our renal transplant patients uh, you don't want to do that to them unless it's very necessary and you, you know talk to transplant or um, their physician so case two a 28-year-old female, G1P0, 13 weeks with right flank pain for five hours. So she reports nausea, vomiting, times one. She denies vaginal bleeding, leakage of fluid, diarrhea, fevers, chest pain, shortens the breath, hematuria, or urinary symptoms. So as you can see, she's a febrile, and essentially her vitals are pretty stable. You do a bedside renal exam, and you take a look at her right kidney, and... What do you think? So 
So it appears that she's got a little bit of hydro on that right side. So you get a urine, CBC, BMP, and she's not vomited since she's been there. Uh, she still has a little mild nausea and some right flank pain. So what do you want to do? What's your next step? Do you want to get a CT abdomen pelvis, renal stone to look for the stone uh, size uh, and uh, maybe call urology if there's a stone there? Do you want to discharge the patient with urology follow-up? Do you want to admit the patient with observation um, and get an intravenous pilogram? Do you want to perform an ultrasound uh, right upper quadrant and check the LFTs, lipase? Uh, because right sided hydro can be normal in pregnancy. So hopefully you were paying attention uh, earlier in the lecture and the answer would be D uh, because you can see um, right sided hydro normally in pregnancy. She may not have right sided hydro as a normal finding that she may actually have a stone, but I think that you need to cover all your bases and make sure that this right flank pain is not her gallbladder. Uh, make sure her LFTs and lipase are fine. Make sure she doesn't have, you know, pancreatitis. Um, and, you know, she is pregnant, so obviously you don't want to do A or C. Um, and, you know, you may still end up discharging the patient, but you just want to make sure that everything is negative and she can tolerate. Because obviously, even if she does have stones in her gallbladder, which actually was the case, again, when I was a fellow, I had a same case, um, and she had hydro, and then we ended up looking at her gallbladder, and she had some stones in the gallbladder. But she ended up being stable, tolerated PO, LFTs were normal, and so we sent her for follow-up because obviously no surgeon wants to do um, surgery on a pregnant patient unless it's absolutely necessary. So just keep that in mind. Case 3, 76-year-old male, smoker, history of kidney stones, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, presents with right flank pain radiating to his right testicle. Um, so pain is progressively worse than over the past week, and he denies fever, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, chest pain, and shortness of breath. So he's a febrile. He is hypertensive. Um, you do our bedside renal exam, and you see this. So obviously he's got hydro, and so what do you want to do? You want to get a CT abdomen pelvis to further assess uh, what's going on, what might be causing his hydro. Do you want to obtain a urology consult? Uh, do you want to admit the patient to medicine for pain control or discharge the patient home with pain meds? So hopefully, again, you've been listening um, and the fact that he is 76 years old and so he's older, he's a smoker, he's got multiple medical problems, he's hypertensive. He wasn't tachycardic, but again, he could be on a beta blocker. Um, so you just want to make sure in these patients that, you know, you're not missing something else that could be the cause. So I would obtain a CT abdomen pelvis to further assess him. You can do a quick aorta, um, bedside aorta um, ultrasound. You can do a quick gallbladder ultrasound. You're not going to rule out dissection for the aorta, but you can um, rule out uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm. Um, and you can obviously look for stones with the gallbladder or cholecystitis. Um, in this case, um, this was his angiogram on the left side. You can see he has a huge um, iliac artery aneurysm on the right side. And then his CT cut on the, um, or I'm sorry, the angiogram's on the left, I said right. Um, and then on the right is the CT that you can see the aorta, uh, or I'm sorry, the iliac artery is huge. Um, and you can see the entire hypoechoic kind of area on the right side of the iliac artery is probably all thrombus, and the, the dye um, is actually flowing through the lumen, which is the more bright area. But the entire diameter is actually that um, white line that goes all the way across the entire thing. So this is a huge iliac artery aneurysm. So you probably would have missed this if you did an aorta ultrasound because we do see the bifurcation and then right as they right as it bifurcates, you can see the iliac arteries, but you can't really follow them down. So I don't know that you would have caught this in a bedside aorta um, uh, ultrasound. But again, just keep this in mind. You want to make sure you don't miss something like this. So, you know, triple A's can be very... Um, uh, can present variably. 
as well as obviously iliac artery aneurysms. And on your emergency medicine boards, you are going to always have an older patient with colic that sounds like a stone and it's going to be a AAA. So just keep that in mind. It's The answer is never renal stone. So this is a right uh, iliac artery aneurysm, obviously compressing the right ureter with resultant hydro. So just in summary, um, like they say, um, not all that wheezes is asthma. I would say not all that not all colicky pain is a stone. So think about think outside the box. Think about uh, like we just talked about um, AAA, um, cholecystitis. Um, a lot of times pancreatitis, necrotizing pancreatitis, um, maybe inflammatory bowel disease. Um, there's a lot of things that can give you colicky pain. Um, so just, you know, always broaden your differential and think about it. Even if the patient says, this is exactly the way my stone felt last time, I know it's that, you know, uh, then don't get sucked into that. Um, just remember that you need to be thorough and uh, especially when they're older and not miss, you know, a colon cancer or something like that that's causing hydro on the ureter. That might not give you colicky pain, but there are lots of things to think about when you see hydro. So just remember that. Thanks so much. If you've got questions, you can email me at cnichols at ufl.edu. All right. Have a great day.